and welcome to the Professional Insight Podcast, Season 6. Still don't know the episode. My name is Brandon Curry. Thanks for joining in. And the rest of us, where are we, guys? Are we all coming up? Oh, there we are. I'm Jeff Collins. Josh Bond. And Trevor Lindy. Gentlemen, good head shift. We have a long, we have a long-standing guest that has finally come back. We have been after her for about a year and a half, if not more. Um, welcome back to the Brandon's show, on the friend of the uh, show. On the verge of harassment, maybe, maybe <laughs> like on the long, long, long time friend of the show, long time guest, our uh, scientist and uh, N- Netflix star from Pandemic. On um, the Netflix show Pandemic, Sarah Ives. Uh, I know she's in the guest room. Oh, there she is. What's up, Sarah? Hey. Hi. <laughs> great to be back. Sarah, it is so hey, great Dad. to see you. Um, we, uh, we've been, you and I have been back and forth on email trying to coordinate schedules because you're currently in San Francisco, which is where you reside. And there's that three hour time difference. And then you've got a crazy schedule. And then we've got, you know, uh, schedules that go live and stuff like that. And then like there was a time, it's been at least a year and a half, if not closer to two, am I not mistaken? Um, I think so. And now has it initially, been that long? like, has it, has it been, it's that, been that long, long since we've seen you? But here's That's the crazy. thing. Here's the thing. Like, I'm going to, I'm going to admit, I'm going to admit something, Sarah, you know, I'm, I'm emailing and I'm like, what, like, like ghost, like, gone like nowhere to be found like you know not even a brandon how's it going and you know obviously the anxiety kicks in and you're just like oh my god what did jeff collins do to offend you pretty much right like it's obviously not me trevor lindy or josh bond it's 100 percent jeff collins said something to offend you and um actually that's not the case that's sorry my assistant case. dropped off my teeth yeah <laughs> There we go. Thank you for right back at it. Yes, thank you that's, for making that, that, that a moment in the episode. Philly thank prison. You. Philly thank you. Philly prison. There. <laughs> Thanks, Jeff. I am in prison. If you Amazing. can see the walls, I'm in. <laughs> so, Sarah, we had a little bit of a health malfunction. Did we not? The pandemic. We, uh, yeah, like you, like go ahead. What has happened? Like. You had a lot of life changes that has happened in the last two years. So why don't we get uh, all of our listeners and viewers back to where you were? Well, Um, just again, bring your, maybe bring the listeners to speed where she was, right? I remember, Mm. you know, you were doing uh, some studies, right? On, on um, the, was it the guinea pigs? The flu vaccine. Oh yeah, the guinea pigs. And then you're moving moving, moving the the ferrets, I believe, right? Yeah. Or, so, or the other way around. I'm trying to think of when exactly we last spoke, um, but I it was sometime, maybe a few months or a year or so after the show Pandemic on Netflix came out. And I think you guys had originally reached out to me because um, my company was getting some notoriety because we were making a COVID um, antibody treatment for people who were hospitalized from COVID. Um, so this was like in the peak of like the early days of the pandemic when there weren't any medicines yet. And you were working on a universal too, were you not? Um, there's the flu vaccine, two separate the universal things. flu vaccine. Right? Yeah. I think the reason you guys found out about me was because of the show and because my company was like in the news a lot making this antibody drug. But my, my, my research had been on a flu vaccine unrelated yep. to COVID vaccines. Yep. Yep. Um, I was working on a universal influenza vaccine and that's why the show followed, um, me and some of my coworkers and, um, like our journey to like raising pigs in Guatemala and vaccinating 100%. them and basically trying to bootstrap a vaccine company without, um, much external funding at all. Only non-dilutive funding from grants. Yep. Um, so yeah, that's, I believe how you guys heard about me and then. But I think you're on your second, going to your second phase or going into your second phase when we spoke last. Yeah, into ferrets for sure. Because you went, you took us through this whole evolution on how the trials go. That's yes. And you had done episode. a couple, a couple, the second one had been completed, but I think you hadn't had the results 
or the second one on the guinea pigs, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, it was actually on ferrets, which is the standard um, animal ferrets model. Ferrets first? Um, yeah, so we did pigs okay. and then ferrets. Um, ferrets is the standard animal model for flu because they their respiratory systems react to flu in a very similar way as humans. Um, and they're small and that. like, you know, easy, much easier to deal with in pigs and less expensive, just better overall. But pigs were a great proof of concept model um, because pigs actually get flu <laughs> and pigs are, you know, a major threat to the next global influenza pandemic because of um, pig farms worldwide, factory farms, those sorts of things. So given that we can't eliminate factory farms, we have to figure out a way to eliminate swine flu so that it doesn't turn into a human flu. Anyways. <clears throat> So, so those are your two arms, right? Essentially that we understood them. The one arm is through your company, you were developing or working on some form of um, COVID uh, response or, or, or antibody. And, and I could be bastardizing the, the terminology there, Sarah. Um, and then the other arm is the independent research on the universal vaccine. Uh, yeah, yeah. So like the COVID universal flu vaccine. Yeah, the the flu vaccine Influenza. stuff was completely separate from the COVID antibody stuff. Um, but this was through the company that I was at called Distributed Bio. Um, and the all the work on the pigs was like, very early stage proof of concept. So just like, does the theory of why our vaccine work? Like, could does is our vaccine actually producing results that look like we could start further animal studies so that then we can go into human clinical trials. Get to that next um, level. Kind of and deal, right? you need money to do all this. <laughs> so right. basically with the data from the pigs, we we're able to demonstrate to the Bill and Melinda Gates foundation that this vaccine really shows promise and that it actually is um, quite effective for what we were using it for. Um, and then they gave us a grant, a non-dilutive grant. So this is money that we don't need to pay back to then do the next set of studies, which were in ferrets and pigs also. Um, so I set up these um, animal studies to be done um, with some experts at University of Georgia and Auburn University. And so that may have been where we left off. We were just kicking off those studies. And these are live challenge studies, which is a term um, in the vaccine field, which means... Um, you vaccinate the animals and then you give them a live challenge. So you test them with the virus and see if they get sick. It's like the ultimate test of like, did the vaccine work or did it not? <laughs> I think um, that's exactly where you were because I don't think you had brought them back from Guatemala, like the study back from Guatemala. Like, I don't think you had brought it back to the States or anything. Yeah, I th we were done with the work in Guatemala. And then we got that information um, from those studies to apply to the, to the Gates Foundation grant. And then this next set of studies was um, to be done uh, in the U.S. So, yeah, we were just kicking off those studies. Um, those have since completed, um, and they actually look really good. Uh, but nice. I should <laughs> – but this is kind of where my story there yeah, ends. Yeah, um, That's right. Because there's a company called Charles River Labs, um, and they acquired Distributed Bio – on the last day of 2020, which we knew, we basically knew was going to happen. It was something we had been working on for years, this partnership. And <clears throat> Charles River Labs acquired the antibody discovery portion of the business. So this was a, a, a part of Distributed Bio where we would engineer therapy or engineer antibodies as therapeutics for other biotech and pharma companies. Um, that's how we made money. Um, these are usually drugs for oncology, for cancer, um, but these antibody drugs could fall within <clears throat> a realm of um, possible therapeutic indications like pain, inflammation, um, other diseases, but a lot of cancer work. So Charles River Labs acquired Distributed Bio on December 31st, 2020, and then Distributed Bio ceased to exist as an actual company. And then um, Centivax which is the name of the flu vaccine that I had been working on that got spun out as a new company. Um, basically like on the next day, like January 1st, 
Um, I mean, there's some paperwork yep. involved in that, but yep. yeah. Um, so Charles River Labs did not acquire the vaccine component of the business. Um, and so Jake Glanville, the CEO of um, Distributed Bio, then became the CEO of Centivax um, when Centivax got spun out as a new company. Um, with the terms of the acquisition, um, I won't get into the nitty gritty, but um, I had to go with Charles River. So I had to become an employee of Charles River and not of Centivax um, because I was considered essential to the um, continuation of the antibody discovery, antibody engineering business. Gotcha. Did you get a raise? <laughs> um, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I got a raise, you know, like the whole like retention, golden handcuffs. Yep. Thing. Um, so I had to say with Charles River Labs. I was the director of strategic partnerships there um, for antibody discovery. Uh, so that meant that I was managing our high value clients that were uh, essentially bringing in the most revenue and the ones who were doing the most projects or the most like difficult projects, like drugs that were really difficult to engineer because of the nature of the um, compounding the drug target. Yeah. The compound um, working with clients that were running more than just like one project with us, but maybe like five or 10 or more um, and mm -hmm. negotiating those big deals of how can we, like make it an attractive sell to these companies that are going to be spending a lot of money on us. So you would deal obviously without disclosing, I mean, part of your company would be dealing with like a Novavax or Nova farm or like these big, big drunk drug companies that then distribute. Um, not like the drug companies that distribute. This is all very, very early stage drug discovery. Gotcha, gotcha, so these gotcha. are drugs that are literally just like being Test. invented right now. And they're still years from animal testing. <laughs> um, and then I, I, after I, I animal want... testing, then there's hum, human clinical testing. So these As soon drugs... as you mention oncology, right? Then your years go up, right? Like the closer yeah. you are to uh, figuring yeah, these out are how like... that shit works, that's the better we are. Yeah, these are, I mean, I one of the like perks of the technology that my company at distributed bio created was the ability to discover and engineer these drugs very rapidly. Um, so you don't have to go through that 15, 20 year cycle to, from when you invent a drug to when it's approved by the FDA to use in patients who need it. Um, okay. There are a lot of things that we could do in the engineering phase to get rid of the um, cycle of kind of starting over. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, Cause that's where an insane amount of time and money gets spent, right? Yeah. And in the development of it. Unfortunately, there's this concept called attrition and there's this rate of attrition of drugs and rate of attrition is like the rate, the speed, like basically how many drugs fail um, like how many compounds fail before you get to your final goal of like starting a human clinical trial or, I mean, obviously getting it approved and having it working in people um, yeah. in the general public. Uh, with antibody drugs, it's tricky. They have a lot of promise because these are drugs, unlike chemo and radiation, where they um, can kind of help in some cases, but have really nasty side effects. Antibody drugs are like a sniper kill to the cancer. They can obliterate the cancer cells to the exclusion of all the healthy tissue. And so just isolate it then essentially, right? Complete isolation. They, yeah, yeah. They basically, we're working on a class of drugs, um, well, usually a class of drugs called immune checkpoint inhibitors. So they essentially teach your own immune system that that cell is cancerous and, they, and your own immune system should then go kill that cell. Um, so it's like a way to retrain the immune system to wake it up to the fact that there's cancer there to then get rid of it. And these Instead drugs, of hyper develop it kind of deal. Right? Yeah, because basically cancer goes undetected in the body. There's a variety of biological um, signals. This is like cascade of signaling that allows a cancer cell to thrive and your, your healthy um, Im like immune system cells to then ignore it. And one of the um, like one of the ways that you can get your body to kill off the cancer naturally is to like wake up the immune system to be like, Hey, this is a cancerous cell. 
you should <laughs> you should kill yeah. it. Yeah, go um, get it. And these drugs, like the the concept of these drugs is not new, and there are already plenty of antibody based therapeutics for oncology that are FDA approved. Like, well, what's the of, old method where they used to put a little bit of the the drug in you to allow your antibodies to then go and attack it, right? Is it, are we far off of that concept? Or coming um, back full circle? Put a, what do you mean put a little bit of the drug in you? Well, you remember there was, I can't remember what it was, but they, they would inject you with a, a certain measure of the drug then to, for your body to build natural antibodies to it. Oh, against the drug. Well, ideally we don't want antibodies against the drug. Um, <clears throat> because no, no, not against the drug, but against the actual infection. Oh yeah. The disease. Yes. Um, this isn't quite like that. Um, this is basically just adding another, uh, molecule that looks like something your body may have created, um, that will then like essentially flag the immune system um, to give it a killing signal, like, hey, this is a bad cell, come come nuke it. Okay. Um, drugs like this are not new. There are plenty of them that are already FDA approved and have been for a long time. Like one of the ones you may have heard of is Humira, um, which is yep. an antibody drug for breast cancer. Um, it targets the a protein called HER2, which is expressed on the surface of some breast cancers. Um, so, um, Humira is like the class of drug that we're working on, but, um, you know, for other types of cancers, against other kinds of targets. Uh, but the beauty of these kinds of antibody drugs are that <clears throat> it looks like a molecule your own body would produce. So you don't, well, you shouldn't, in most cases, you won't have the toxic side effects that you would from um, chemotherapy agents, for example. Um, and this drug is, it, it really is a sniper kill of, of the cancer um, in theory. So it leaves all healthy tissue intact and just completely obliterates the cancer. There's a lot of nuance that gets, uh, makes it a little more difficult. Like if it's like a solid tumor, for example, like a mass growth, or if it's a liquid tumor, like B cell lymphoma, cancer of the blood. Um, so there's lots of different like ways to approach cancer therapeutics with, or cancer, treating cancer with antibody drugs. But what my company distributed bio, what I helped develop there was a technology platform that would allow um, us or other companies who license the platform to discover drugs against certain types of cancers very, very rapidly and engineer them um, to basically like optimize them to be the perfect therapeutic that would be very potent. So you wouldn't have to administer a lot of it, um, which means you don't have to risk as many side effects. You don't have to manufacture as much. It's cheaper, you know, all that stuff. Um, so basically find a really potent drug really quickly that would have the least amount of side effects. So it should look like a, a protein that your body would normally produce. Um, and that was a very attractive model because it was very widely adopted by the industry, both pharmaceutical companies who are working on developing these kinds of drugs and also smaller biotech companies. Um, and our platform was malleable, so it could work for companies that were trying to make like an antibody drug, like a normally shaped antibody protein that you'd find in the human body, like Humira, for example. And it also worked for companies who are using more advanced um, engineering techniques to um, put our drug in the context of like a chimera or a a different type of like a combination of drugs that would um, deliver even a more potent kill to the cancer cell. They're called, um, well, I won't get into the weeds, but it's, <laughs> it's called um, <laughs> CAR T or um, chimeric antigen receptor T cell. So basically a way to train your body, uh, your own immune system um, more efficiently to go and kill off the cancer cell. Anyways, this platform was 
um, highly attractive to those companies. And we are acquired by Charles River because Distributed Bio, they found Distributed Bio to be the um, the best company that could make this kind of drug. So they bought us because they wanted to own that technology. Yep, nice. <laughs> so I go with Distributed, or I go with Charles River Labs. Um, so this is like in the beginning of 2021. I'm the director of strategic partnerships, so I'm working on negotiating the business contracts for our large uh, partnerships, um, like high value clients. And I, and Cenivax is now a separate company, and it's a little odd for me because for the last five years, I had been leading the Universal Flu Vaccines Program at Distributed Bio. I've been leading the Cenivax program, um, you know, setting up the experiments in Guatemala. Um, doing, um, running all the assays, setting them up in the lab in California, um, flying around the world to give talks, scientific talks on the results, um, applying to grants. Um, so it was a little weird to like have kind of like what, what I really cared about and like what I had been pouring so much time and effort for many, many years to have that just not be part of me anymore. And I think there was a bit of a like identity crisis of sorts because I like my identity was a flu vaccine scientist. Like that's how I saw myself. I, I thought that I was going to change the world that way. And I was, and you know, I was featured in Netflix. So that's how my peers saw me as well. Like people would recognize me whether I knew them or not, like as a flu researcher. And I had a lot of pride in that because I felt like this is the way that I can make a difference in the world. And it's something I'm really good at. And it's something I love doing. And I just, I was fine pouring all my time and energy and making sacrifices in other parts of my life to just do that. And I loved it and I was good at it. And then all of a sudden, because of, you know, business transactions, um, and some, and the fact that I was like talented at some other things too, all of a sudden I was unaffiliated with Centivax and now I'm doing this other thing, which I kind of had been doing all along. I just never considered it as like my identity. It was just something I did for work. <laughs> um, so it was a little would you say odd. that would be your passion though? Would it still be your passion or would it be more the, the flu being your passion? Well, at that time, I just didn't really know. There's just a lot of changes that have happened in my life. And like, I was trying to figure out, okay, well, now I work at Charles River Labs and I really enjoy what I'm doing here. But like, it's just weird, like when, when doors close and it just like, you kind of didn't expect them. Well, you, you didn't, didn't see it through. You, you didn't, didn't see it through. Right. right. These things I set up. And actually for that first year after the acquisition, I was um, a consultant for Cenivax. Um, and that was essentially so that it was like a tech transfer process. Mm -hmm. So even though I was a full-time employee of Charles River Labs and that was my day job um, at nights and on the weekends, I was still working on the flu vaccine. I was setting up those studies at um, Auburn University and University of Georgia on the pigs and ferrets for the live challenge studies. I was like writing the MSAs. I was writing the contracts, I was setting up the study designs, and I was going into lab after work to then make the vaccines. So you're doing both anyways at that point? I was doing both, yes. Um, so there was, but I, I knew it wasn't, I knew it was temporary. I wasn't actually sure how long it would last, um, but it ended up being just a year because um, just how these things sustainability. Yeah. Or? Um, well it was basically a tech transfer so I could like get those studies launched and then teach their new employees on how to run the vaccine yep. program. Hand off, hand off. Yes. Yeah. It was like handing off the baton, um, to make sure that like all of my skills there were redundant with other people. Yeah. yeah. So I basically needed to like get everyone up to speed on everything I've been doing, how to run the project, how the vaccines are made, um, how the like contracts are set up. Um, so I, I was a consultant for a year there. So all of 2021. Um, <clears throat> and then, so yeah, I guess we, let's see. And in 20, so I fast forward to the end of 2021. Um, 
I'm getting really into swimming at this point. I've been swimming for about a year, open water swimming, you know, pandemic hobby that I just kind of got really into. And it turns out San Francisco is an amazing place for open water swimming because it's (laughs) freaking cold. So you get this like huge rush of like adrenaline, whatever other neurotransmitters you get. But I didn't do it like for that. It just like feels like a high. It feels amazing. And um, it was my, I had never really been an athlete before. And then all of a sudden I'm like, wow, I'm really good at this. Like I can like go for a long time. So I got into like the, um, you know, marathon swimming. Um, Was really inspired by these incredible athletes that I would swim with. So I'm getting really into swimming. Fantastic. That's fantastic. And I'm kind of like transitioning to like, okay, I can, I can be an athlete and also be a scientist, like kind of entertaining these things in my head that like, maybe I can do things like I can be more than one thing. Olympian Um, and scientist. (laughs) And yeah, trying to balance like, okay, I, I work at Charles river. There's a lot of parts of that job that um, are really fulfilling. Um, but yeah, and then I'm not really a flu vaccine scientist anymore. I mean, I kind of am, but trying to figure out how to like mesh those Stay like involved. in my mind and then also like getting really into like swimming and just like the whole community, like everyone's so welcoming. There's all, you know, with sports, there's accountability. Like you have practices, you have workouts and people expect you to show up. And it was really nice, like having like this brand new community of people that were genuinely really excited to see me every day that were my coworkers. And that was just such like a cool thing to start discovering. So I'm getting really into swimming and I'm doing like other workouts with them, um, going on trail runs, like getting really into athletics. So and, what's a marathon swim? Um, like what, what would, would a marathon <laughs> swim be considered? Technically a marathon swim is, I think anything over 10,000 kilometers. Wow. And by marathon swim rules, it has to be just in a swimsuit. So no wetsuit, neoprene, anything. Just a swimsuit, a single cap made out of latex or silicone, um, and a pair of goggles. And you can wear earplugs. Um, but no swim aids, like no fins, no kickboards, no wetsuits, no life jacket, no sun. So how long are you swimming for? Um, well, it depends, but, um, I mean, some of my longer swims were three, four hours, four and a half hours. Um, at that point, I don't think I'd actually completed any quote unquote marathon swims, but it's like, um, this community that I'm in where there's people that are doing English channel crossings, North channel crossings, Um, Like those are the types of athletes that um, I was training with and it was really inspiring and fun to just like be out there in the middle of um, the bay, like at sunrise or out um, where I swim at like ocean beach and China beach along the Western coast of San Francisco, just being out there in the ocean when the sun rises and having dolphins swimming around me and just like, learning to relinquish control, I think was really important for me at the time because all these life changes were starting to happen. And I was entering a new chapter of my life professionally and trying to figure out like where I fit in. And I've always You're still been pretty young what... too, so, right? Like, so <laughs> yeah, at this time of... I was, I was 31 and yeah, I had a lot of career success early on. Um, like with the acquisition of, Um, my company and me being like, I was a six employee at distributed bio. So like I was very involved with building everything that made us successful and with the Netflix show and just having people know me from that. I, it was awesome. Like having um, like, I don't really, I don't care about fame at all, but just the fact that people knew me for something that I really cared about, which was um making a medicine that could save lives like that was so important to me that I was I felt like I was doing something that really mattered and then like kind of having to take a little step back from that and kind of reorganize my professional life um and kind of like give up control and let life like just take its path um swimming was really helpful with that because everything about swimming is about not being in control like you get in the water and the water is 
box. In winter, it's 49, 50 degrees Fahrenheit. So in Celsius, that's like oh. 10, 10 to 12 Celsius or so um, oh. in the winter. And in the summer, it gets up to 60, 62 Fahrenheit, which is, oh God, so doing this conversion in my head. It's I want to say it's around 15 Celsius. Still cool. Sorry, my mental math is that's not crazy. Working, but, um, yeah, that's crazy. Yeah, it's cold, and the air is cold too. In in the winter, the air's um, oh god, more Celsius conversions. It's in the winter, the <laughs> air can be before sunrise 35, 40 degrees Fahrenheit, which is about uh, single digit pluses in Celsius. Single digit, high single digit Celsius. The air is. Um, so it's just cold. It's uncomfortable. Um, and learning to just sit with that discomfort and keep going, like put my toes in and it just feels like ice. Without a wetsuit too, eh? Yeah. So you're not no even wet. Yeah, that's crazy. The wind is howling. Like it's, um, you know, sometimes 20 mile per hour winds, which again, kilometers per hour. Oh God. Okay. I'm not just, I'm just not going to do that. <laughs> sorry. Yeah, don't, you, you can just do, just do your, your, your Imperial. That's fine. It's really freaking windy. Yeah. And just yeah. every morning getting in and forcing like you get your toes in and you're like shocked. You're just like, wow, this sucks. And then you just keep going. It's going to wake you right water, up though. Damn. Uh, the water's pretty murky. Like sometimes the visibility is like you can see like your body length or like two body lengths or something. But I mean, bay water, there's a lot of sediment mixed in. There's tons of water flowing in and out of the Golden Gate Bridge into the bay and out of the bay. So there's a lot of stuff in the water. So you can't see. Um, you go numb right away. You can't feel. You can't see. You can't hear because you have earplugs in because the cold water does this crazy thing to your eardrums to make you. Anyway, anyways, you have to wear earplugs. Um, so you can, and then you're wearing these these goggles that are usually foggy and scratch, and it's dark out still, <laughs> and um, the water visibility Sounds like so is much very low. Fun. Doesn't sound comfortable. That's <laughs> you're, you're, sure. you're selling me on it. You're selling me on it. Yeah. Wow. You get it, and then there's <laughs> things in the water. There's seals. There's sea lions. There's sharks. There's dolphins. Where I swim at China Beach, there mm. are great white sharks. We wow. know that there are. Um, there. They've been spotted by surfers many, many times out at Ocean Beach, where I swim a lot. So it's a little um, exhilarating. So there's things that you're basically deaf, blind. Um, you have limited sensory function. You can't feel. Um, you can't. Yeah. So basically, you just have to give up control. And then there's the aspect of the waves. It's not like this is a lake. You're not just getting in. You take your own time. Sometimes these waves, uh, the wave face will be um, like as tall as a person or what they call double overhead or twice as tall as a person. So there's a serious risk that you could break your neck if you get in in the wrong way. Um, mm. So it's, mm. it's kind of scary all around. And like where I swim, there's a lot of shore breaks. So it's not like you kind of wade in and the waves are, you can kind of dive under the waves. These waves are crashing on you in two feet of water. So you can't like get underneath the wave into the water. They're just slamming your head into the sand. <laughs> And, you know, I, I get scratch like cuts and scratches on my face and on my body. Um, so anyways, swimming is, <clears throat> you just have to give up control and trust your body and not panic. Like learning to control panic is 80% of open water swimming, at least in a dangerous place where I do it. Cause the currents are strong. You can't see anything. You can't hear anything. You can't feel anything. You don't know what's underneath you. There are definitely animals underneath you. Not every day, but sometimes, and you don't know mm -hmm. which day that is. Um, any day I swim, there's a risk of running head on into a jellyfish and getting these crazy stings on my face and arms. Um, <clears throat> so yeah, and just learning to like be okay with being so uncomfortable was quite an eye-opening experience to me. Um, but also the rush of the cold, it's addictive and the camaraderie of doing the same thing, like with your friends every day in such a beautiful, breathtaking place in the middle of like a huge city where people don't even know these places exist, like these places where you can swim. Although there are signs that say no swimming because it's so <laughs> dangerous. Um, but if you just ignore those <laughs> and go swimming anyways, it's like you get the best sunrise views in on the entire coast like it's just so amazing how long did it take you to get used to the cold cold water that must well, have been it i'm trying cold showers and it's hard 
I think cold showers are, you, you don't quite get the same effect because it's like a mix of air and water because like the water droplets you never get like all the benefits of cold immersion but it's mm-hmm. just as like annoyingly painful <laughs> so i was never into the cold showers <laughs> i'm trying it's tough i just need to rip off the bandit and go all in in the cold yeah. water <laughs> yeah. well, well, um, so so sorry there are there are like medical benefits to this cold immersion right like that you know it's you know, obviously be- better than a cup of coffee, but it also from the immune system, right? Perspective. And, um, and the heart, the heart too. It's supposed to be really the good. Heart, the heart, circulatory system. Yeah. Your mind and, even. Yeah. You know, <laughs> in the swimming community, you hear all sorts of things, um, whether or not they're backed by um, double blind, placebo controlled <laughs> scientific studies that are peer reviewed. I don't know. Um, but honestly, I don't even care if what the health benefits are or what they are exactly i love it so much that i think i would do it even if there i would definitely do it even if there weren't any benefits so it's it's fun to be like oh yeah you know it makes you um helps with athletic recovery and it helps with memory and all that and like i do feel that but i just love it so much that I would do it anyways. <laughs> um, so now you 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 were talking about like this this journey that you're going on. Oh yeah, okay, right? sorry, I got, with, I got with... distracted. No, no, no. This is great because I we need to get updated on everything. Um, yeah. We're at the beginning of uh, where you know you, you did the full year trial at, in 2021 um, at Charles River. Yeah, so I was a consultant then, with Sunnyvax. Yep, and I was working yeah. at Charles River. Oh yeah, okay. So we're at the end, towards the end of 2021. Um, I'm doing all these crazy workouts. Um, I had never really been an athlete before. Kind of like finding my new place in life as like, okay, I work at Charles River now. What's my next step? Do I stay here? No senti back. Um, I, so there was like some non-compete so i couldn't go i knew i at least couldn't go to sunny vax for a while gotcha um with some like paperwork because like charles river wanted to make sure that they had like i was so yep. important to charles river yep. that they wanted to yep. keep me you're a key employee yes yep. <clears throat> yes so, so they didn't want they didn't want them to solicit you away exactly so yep. gotcha. i was trying to figure out things um hitting the athletic thing really hard and on Halloween, October 31st, 2021, I had a stroke. Ooh. Ooh. Yes. And Get out, shit. didn't make any sense. Um, I was 31. I was in prime physical condition. Um, don't know why. Um, I spent a few days. I had a stroke. I was at home. Um, my boyfriend at the time, who I'd been with for many years, he was luckily at home with me. He saw the whole thing happen. So he called um, 911 and the paramedics came. Um, and I went to the hospital in an ambulance. And I'd never been in an ambulance before. I never had any sort of like health issues. issue ever. Wow. Um, other than just going to my like annual checkups yeah. and them telling me that I'm good. <laughs> so uh, I spent a few days in the hospital. It's all kind of a blur, but I had to get a gazillion tests done. Um, and at the end of it, they found out that I have a hole in my heart. Um, a PFO? A PFO, patent foramen ovale. Yeah. Um, Is that Doc? Does Doc have that? That's, that's Yeah, Doc has that. Doc, Jesus. Sorry, our friend, a mutual friend of ours, it happened to him. He's 30. Exact same thing. Get yeah. Cut, it, chiropractor, um, health nuts, mm-hmm. you know, uh, and just while he's working on one of our buddies, at his at his office it was purely coincidental it was at lunchtime and he didn't take a lunch to fit him in and as he's you know because he uh my our, another buddy uh, was in a bad bad um anyways bike car accident and um so he had he has regular um therapy sessions and to fit him in but the the irony is he usually eats lunch alone because and and so he was at his clinic and we have one of the top stroke uh, hospitals in Niagara, which is only 10 minutes away. And his life was saved because of that. So it sounds very similar to your situation. That it, like you yeah, were at home, crazy. you didn't know about the PFO, but a lot of people have PFOs. This is a normal 
like, and they don't know that this happened, but go, please go continue. Yeah. On. So I was, there was just, That's yeah, insane. it was a lot to wrap my head around because I always thought of myself as a very healthy person, especially like I had always um, prioritized my health. Um, always like, you know, exercising and doing that. But I had never really been an athlete until the last year. And I was like, this doesn't make sense. Like, did this cause this? But it turns out a patent for Amino Valley is, um, it's basically a separation between the left and right atrium, like a whole, it's basically like a, f- a flap that is normally mm-hmm. present in fetuses. Um, and soon after a baby is born, like within three or six months, that flap will like close over and it basically becomes a wall. So there's no blood flow in between the left and right atria. The reason it's there um, in like when the baby is uh, before it's born is so that it can transfer blood between the left and right atrium to get oxygen because it's not actually breathing air. It's just getting, um, it has the umbilical cord. So it needs, I don't really know the, exact biology of it but basically fetuses need this to survive in the womb um but after they can start breathing air once they're born it is not necessary so it closes over um in about 20 to 25 percent of people it doesn't fully close over um and it's usually not a problem there's like a little bit of hole remaining and most people will go their whole lives and not know in my case, it was very much open still. Like it hadn't closed over essentially at all. And there's no way that I would have known this um, unless I specifically had tests to examine it as a kid. But because I never had any symptoms, like I wasn't like randomly passing out during exercise and gym class as a kid or anything, there's just no reason to have investigated it. So it turns out I had this gaping hole in between my left and right atrium. And the reason that's a problem is if I get a blood clot for any reason, um, that blood clot, instead of being filtered out by my lungs, um, it can go from my right atrium into my left atrium, which has a direct connection to my aorta into my brain. So what likely happened was I was probably doing some really intense athletic activity. In the week leading up to my stroke, I actually had Mm -hmm. done like the most activity ever in my life. I was doing two workouts a day. I was swimming, I was running, I was training for a bunch of stuff. Um, I ran a 10 K running race on Saturday and I was probably dehydrated. Um, My blood was, I mean, I think my blood was probably a little thick and sticky from just so much activity and being dehydrated. And I probably had the very small clot, um, which normally again, wouldn't have been a problem, but because I have that big hole in my heart, this little clot went through my right atrium into my left atrium um, and then straight into my aorta and into my brain. And what they showed on the MRI is that a portion of my light, my left hypothalamus was dead. It was, it had like died in the stroke, like it had wow. lost blood flow and it was gone. Um, and the crazy thing was I only had stroke symptoms for like 20 minutes And then I was woozy for the next few hours, but I was like, fine. And so they're like, okay, well, you probably didn't have a real stroke. You probably had a TIA or a a mini stroke. Um, But MRI revealed, no, I had a full blown stroke. And it just didn't make sense why I had a full recovery because I, from talking to people, you know, from this whole thing, I've learned about other people in their late 20s, early 30s, even other 31 year olds who have had strokes from a PFO that didn't make a full recovery, or at least not for six months or 12 months. You know, people have to go to speech therapy, they go to physical therapy, Um, they need to learn how to um, regain those speech and motor functions. And it just was so like it didn't make any sense. Like, why did I get so lucky? Like my left hypothalamus is donezo. Um, or my left. Can you just explain to everyone what you, what, what, okay. So just repeat what you just said and then really dumb it down for the four of us and then explain what that part does in your brain. We have no idea what you, that, that was, that might as well have been in pig Latin. I know a little yeah. bit from psychology, like, but it's a portion yeah. of your brain. Sorry, right. it was it was my thal- yeah. my left thalamus, not my hypothalamus. Um, so when I was 
of course, I'm like Googling all this shit on my phone, like as the oh, for neurologist sure. and cardiologist, they're talking to me. Which is scary enough when like, you Google it. And I was like, I, need, I don't even, I haven't even heard of the thalamus since like high school biology because I just like didn't really need to know about it for any reason. Um, but the thalamus is like a control center. Um, so it controls speech. It controls like high level functioning. Um, it controls like movement. Um, but I guess the nice thing about the brain is that there's a lot of redundancy built in. And mm-hmm. also the neurons have this feature called plasticity, which means that they're malleable and they're able to take on different functions that what they were originally created for by remaking electrical connections with different neurons. So what had happened with me was my left, see, uh, the, the thalamus, it's, I think it's like a butterfly type shape and there's like a left portion and a right portion. And um, my left thalamus was where the stroke was. So that tissue died. And so those neurons are never coming back. But within a matter of 15, 30 minutes, my brain was already rewiring connections to restore speech and motor function. So while I couldn't talk or walk or think for you know, 15 minutes, um, I couldn't like move the entire right side of my body was paralyzed. So I couldn't move the right side Mm -hmm. of my face, uh, my right arm. It was really scary because I was conscious this whole time. And I knew what was happening. I was like, I know what the symptoms of stroke are. And I know I'm like having one, but it doesn't, I I can't possibly be having one because that like strokes are something that like old people have. Like I just never, (laughs) anyways, it was really weird. Um, but my brain like rewired itself. And just like fixed itself in 30 minutes. And um, crazy. while I'm in the hospital, I'm trying to figure out and, and over the next few months, like how, why did I get so lucky? It doesn't make any sense. I guess it's just random chance. Well, but, Sarah, there, there, there's another, I'm a big uh, sports nut and there's a, a famous hockey player, uh, Chris Letang. He's had two strokes while playing in the NHL and he's back to playing again too. And he's in his wow. early 30s. So maybe the fact that you were in such good physical shape possibly could have really helped you too, right? So just to give you an idea of someone else around your age that had happened, then it's happened twice to them. Wow. Wow. Scary. So, But yeah, so I guess, I don't know, my brain was healthy enough and um, plastic enough to basically just rewire those neurons and restore all my normal function. Oh, you're Um, lucky. You're lucky. The cardiologist says, okay, well, you need to get the heart hole fixed. Otherwise, you're just going to risk Reoccur. having another one of these. So um, I was going through my options and there's a pretty simple procedure that's routinely done that they basically insert this like like a, a metal disc. It's kind of like actually like two umbrellas and it like cinches the hole shut. Um, so I was scheduled for that procedure the following week. Um, and in the meantime, they put me on um, Plavix, which is like a heavy duty anticoagulant um <clears throat> to prevent another one and um, blood thinner. Yeah, yeah it's not exactly a blood thinner it's just like an anti-platelet but anyways yeah basically yeah. a blood thinner yeah. um and i was scheduled for that procedure the following week and met with like the cardiologist who does that surgery and i was reading about it and i just felt like he was kind of treating me like a, a like a number in the system and not really as a person and not like fully addressing my concerns um one of which was i have a severe nickel allergy and this device is made out of nickel and it doesn't Jeez. take much googling to figure out like what happens when you insert like a nickel device into a heart when you're allergic to it it's really bad <laughs> um but he basically he just wrote- dismissed it he wrote me off saying, well, you don't know you have a nickel allergy. And this is something that many <laughs> men actually have told me. They're like, well, how do you know you have a nickel allergy? But as females, or at least women growing up, like wearing jewelry our whole lives, we know. I yeah. can't go to a random costume jewelry store and buy jewelry because I will <laughs> have a serious reaction. Like my yeah. whole life, I've never been able to wear any jewelry that's nickel which is something that men just don't think about because they've never had to do that before. 
So all the and jewelry. Buying nickel jewelry for women really don't. Don't stick around those women too long. Eh? Yeah. So you really like, buy nickel you, jewelry for girls. He's like, well, it's in your head. You're not really allergic to nickel. And even if you are, the chances that having a skin allergy to nickel, um, the chances of that turning into a bad situation in your heart, like, you know, having cardiac arrest or another stroke or um, having to then surgically remove the device, those chances are still low. And I said, okay, well, I feel really uncomfortable putting something permanently into my heart that I know I'm severely allergic to. And so I called off the surgery. I was like, I can't do this. And so I met with, I got like a second and third opinion, like at other places. Good for you. Good for you. Um, and my options were pretty grim. It was stay on blood thinners forever indefinitely, which limits like activities I can do. I basically can't do any sports where there's a realistic possibility that I'll get a big bruise or that I'll right. um, get a head right. injury. Because if I get a bruise on my head, um, I could hemorrhage to death in my brain because the bruise will just never stop bruising or never stop bleeding. So, and then, you know, things just like future things become difficult, like falls, um, you know, it complicates if I wanted to get pregnant. Um, just lots of things where staying on blood thinners indefinitely just seems like a bad idea. Yeah, um, okay. And then, I talked to this this cardiologist. He's like, well, we could open you up the old-fashioned way and do open-heart surgery and close it with stitches. And that sounded bad because the recovery is like many months and there's, you know, the risk of infection. Anytime you, anytime you open up a chest cavity, sure. <laughs> you're, not it's not well, – yeah. Like you really got to have a good – yeah. Our, our buddy, our buddy who, who has this, it went, and maybe you're going to get to this and I apologize, but – he got he they went up through his groin and closed off the pf the the, the pfo that's the thing i couldn't heart. get yeah why so, because the thing the that they use to close it is made out of um a nickel type it's oh geez it's about half nickel half titanium and titanium i'm fine with but nickel i'm not so that procedure would have been great because they just make this little incision in yep. um your femoral vein in your groin and they snake all this stuff up to your heart they put it mm -hmm. in and then they mm -hmm. basically take all the wires out and then you're left with this like thing cinching your heart hole together and that's there for the rest of your life but i couldn't get that um because well i didn't want to get it because yeah. i know i'm allergic to nickel and i know the side effects of uh, basically the risk for things going wrong for me outweighed the benefit of having that procedure done so there was a couple months where i basically had to take off of work because my full-time job became figuring out how I was going to not have another stroke. Um, and it's definitely a scary time. Um, and I'm grappling with all the emotional shock of like one having almost died, like knowing that that day could have been it for me. And then sure. like figuring out why I didn't like, how am I still like thinking and doing all this stuff and like reading on my computer and like, it just, it, it Mind just didn't blowing. make any sense to me, like how I was totally fine. And I was swimming throughout this whole time. Um, I just got back to the Existential crisis. <laughs> yeah, I was like, I need to go get, I need some cold water. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So yeah, I was just swimming throughout. I was like, well, if I went 31 years and was doing all my normal stuff and didn't have a stroke, then I'm just going to keep going another couple of months and just keep doing stuff. But I was on like heavy duty blood thinners. So that was kind of like a nice peace of mind. Um, anyway, so I saw a bunch of cardiologists and I ended up, um, I found something through like a friend who hooked me up with this other cardiologist who told me about this procedure in Germany that isn't FDA approved. And he's like, you know, I had a woman who was also allergic to nickel and couldn't get this and didn't want open heart surgery. So I flew her to Germany to get this procedure done. That's also minimally invasive, where they stick it in through your femoral vein. <clears throat> But they essentially put in like plastic stitches in your heart mm -hmm. instead of leaving a metal device left behind. And so I started looking up like flights to Germany and trying to contact this doctor. And then I found this other guy who's actually in Chicago at Rush University, Clifford Kavinsky, who has been doing this in the United States um, without FDA approval because <laughs> it's kind of like a research yeah. project. Like he's yeah. getting yeah. data yeah. Yeah. in yeah. order to start a clinical trial, which you need. Um, so he, he's like an expert at doing the procedure that I didn't want, but he's also been working on 
um, developing a protocol to be able to do this other thing. It's called Noble Stitch. Noble Stitch is the company that like patented the um, technology to do it without metal. Um, so I just called this guy one day and I was like, <laughs> hey, hey, I'm a little bit desperate, but I'm a 31 year old female. I'm in peak physical condition. I have I don't have any blood clotting disorders. Um, I have a PFO. I have a nickel allergy. I can't get the whatever the thing that yep. is. I can't get that. Um, I need you to perform this procedure on me. And he was like, I've never had anyone contact me like this before, but um, okay. Our first opening is January 6th. And I was like, Oh, thank God. And so I had to go through a few additional tests um, for him to get clearance. Like I had to get another ultrasound of my heart and I had to get another couple things, uh, a, f a few more blood tests to make sure that I didn't have any underlying genetic disorders for blood clotting stuff. Um, and yeah. And so then I, um, I'm from Madison, Wisconsin. So I flew home for Christmas that December and I just stayed an extra bit. And my mom drove me to Chicago at Rush University in the beginning of January. And um, he sewed me up. Um, it's basically like it. a Good. little nice. robotic thing. They insert it through your groin and there's like an x-ray machine going on the whole time so they can see it. It's just wild that they can do this procedure while the heart is thumping and what i learned from like getting all these like tests done is like when you, when you see the heart beating inside the chest cavity it's like an earthquake like once a second it's just totally insane the way wait it you're awake you're awake no i was fully sedated oh you watched the video after oh. you watched <laughs> no the video, i wish but i've seen like parts of it and i for all like oh. the ultrasounds and stuff i was awake so i could see the heart is just shaking the entire chest cavity. So whoosh, whoosh. And it's crazy that they can go in there while it's like all jumbly and shaking. And there's tons of blood squirting through the arteries. <sighs> and they can sew it up. Like, wow, <sighs> what's happening? And they didn't have to stop my heart. It's just totally wild. And I watched a ton of YouTube videos on it too. So like, even though I wasn't awake for my procedure, I kind of feel like I was because I knew exactly what was happening <laughs> from me. <laughs> from Ugh, I wouldn't want to watch any of that. That would freak me right out. How long yeah. was the recovery for that? Um, pretty short. So I was under anesthesia for two and a half hours. They actually had to put in, they did the whole procedure <coughs> and then they did like the x-ray test to see if the hole was closed and they determined that it wasn't fully closed. So they had to go in again and do oh, a whole a another one. And so they do two. So I was actually under for two and a half hours. And I have two of these noble stitches in my heart, they call it they're made out of polypropylene, which is like essentially plastic. Um, and they're not they have little knots. So they're basically these things, even though my heart's going like whoosh, 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 every like, you know, every beat, it's like holding my heart together for the rest permanently for the rest of my life, I should have these. So anyways, I wake up after two and a half hours and I'm pretty groggy and I have to stay there. Um, I have to like, they've just opened up my femoral vein and cut through my hip flexors. So I can't walk. Um, so I laid there for like six hours and then I went home. I, my mom picked me up and she brought me to a hotel across the street and we stayed at that hotel that night. And there's a lot of bruising and stuff and my heart definitely feels tender. Like it feels like I got punched in the heart. Mm. Um, yeah, that's gotta be a weird feeling. Yeah. I was like, I remember going to sleep that night. Like I wasn't sure if I was just like going to die and not wake up because <laughs> all of this trauma had just happened to my body and I didn't, and there's no, there's not much data on this um, procedure. Like I don't know the rate of adverse reactions cause it's not FDA approved. Um, and it's very new. So I just don't know what to expect, but it was like the best option. So I did it. And I remember thinking like, well, I almost died at least one other time in my life. And like, I, I just, it's kind of like swimming where like, if it's going to happen, it's going to happen. And you have to relinquish control. Like if Roll a shark is going to come and chop me in half, it's going to come and chop me in half, but having panic is not going to change the situation. So I kind of just went to sleep that night thinking like, well, I don't know. Goes. Maybe I'll be here in the morning and maybe I won't. <laughs> and I woke up the next day and I was like, I'm alive. <laughs> I made it. <laughs> and did you go swimming in the cold water right away? <laughs> Not right away. Um, I was Oh my God, home. you didn't. 
You actually no. did. No. Oh, I was at home in Madison with my parents for a week or two. And I, I couldn't like, I could kind of walk, but I had to like lift my leg in and out of cars because they had to cut through my hip flexor. Um, no, so like tender. there was like a week where I couldn't really walk. And also just my heart felt strained. Like it felt just tender. You're recovering. Yeah. Yeah. And I'm like, uh, Two days later, I took a walk around the block. It was also crazy. It was like some one of those polar vortex things. Um, so it was just like uncomfortable to be outside. And yeah. I, I I really like couldn't walk up the stairs. Um, this so, is what, January, February of this year? This is January. In, in Wisconsin. No, 20, 2022. <laughs> this is January 2022. Okay. Um, so needless to say, you didn't go to a Packers football game. No, and then yeah, a week or two few. later. That is like, that is going to lead me to my next question, but that's okay. Keep going. Good old Aaron Rodgers. I, I flew but to go San ahead. Francisco like two weeks later, um, and by the end of January, I was swimming again. Wow! Basically, as, <laughs> wow. Soon, as, the, <laughs> as soon as the incision healed, like it had, it was kind of like scabbed. I had stitches. Um, that's your therapy now. That's your therapy. Yeah. Before I left Chicago, they went and they removed the stitches. The ones on like the inside dissolve, like inside my body for the vein, but the stitches on my skin, they're the kind mm-hmm. that they have to take out. Mm-hmm. So I go in, get the stitches out, fly back to San Francisco, wait for the incision to heal because I don't want like crazy ocean bacteria giving me some festering infection. Um, and yeah, my swim pod, they're really really sweet actually they would like form this like diamond shape around me and they were so worried about me and they're like not swimming more than six inches away from me <laughs> but oh, it was just so nice, nice. and in january the ocean is freaking cold it's you know 10 10 degrees celsius and it's windy and um but i was just so happy to be back there and i wasn't doing any like hard workouts or anything and obviously no running and um there was a recovery period of three or four months where i couldn't do anything that was jostling to my heart because the stitches were like in fresh, they were fresh and the tissue was inflamed and you sure. Know, I, yeah. So my, my heart tissue had to heal. So I took it pretty easy for three or four months and I couldn't do any activities that would give me any bruises, especially a, like a bruise, a brain hemorrhage, because um, I was still on the heavy duty blood thinners for the next like six months. Um, but you're yeah. still swimming in the cold water, ten degrees. Yeah, but swimming like shouldn't be a contact sport. So if there yeah. were like really big waves and I would have to duck dive or risk getting like seriously slammed into the sand, I just wouldn't swim. Um, because and you're a female, so you don't have to worry about shrinkage. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, exactly. Collins. Good, 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 good contribution to the podcast. I've got, to, I've got to be a layman here, yeah. right? That's yeah. great. Amazing. <laughs> So yeah, and then, um, oh, also, so as soon as I got back in February, um, let's see, February? Yeah. That's where we are right now. Yep, February 2022. That's where we are. Uh, February 2022, um, I got laid off from Charles River. Jeez. So (laughs) kind of in the middle of all this. um, Because, I mean, I hadn't really, like, I basically had to, like, take leave starting from like when I had my stroke so I wasn't really like doing much at work um, you had a stroke <laughs> you, yeah. you had a stroke you, 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 can't, you can't you can't leave somebody off because yeah. they're sick you get um, in big trouble good, know, good old America like, that's great you know yeah they're like well <laughs> I don't can't know be like what, take a year off and here's a raise that's yeah. what take capitalism here. there we go yeah, yeah. Yeah, so I'm no comment. I'm just gonna say yeah, that. Yeah, no 100%, 100%. Um, I come back from my surgery and I get laid off. Um, no additional comments on that. <clears throat> um, we'll comment for you. Yeah, and we so got you, then, Don't worry. And then also in the same week that I got laid off, um, my boyfriend and I, who we decided to break up. Um, And we had been together for about eight years and we had been living together for five years. It's just one of those like things like you really have to like figure out your life when you have a major event. And yeah, yeah, we decided to break up and I had to move out. So in like a four day period, I was like looking at, you know, so you had a whirlwind. Yeah. So I was like searching for apartments. Um, trying to figure out like, you know, what's going to happen with job and money and stuff. Um, mm. 
wow. since I, that I got laid off. And the whole, I think there was a lot of self-discovery that was needing to happen because I was no longer a flu vaccine scientist. Like my whole, my whole identity was my professional identity. Um, and in my 20s, that was my priority. Like I sacrificed a lot of time, like with friends and social life type things so that I could dedicate myself to work. And um, it paid off. I had a lot of, I did have a lot of career success early sure. on, but like that was my whole identity was like being a scientist and being known for that and like creating these like drug platforms that were then um, uh, worth a lot of money to Charles yep. River. Yep. So <clears throat> <laughs> yeah. So then in, on March 1st, I moved into my new apartment, which is where I am right now. Sweet. Um, that's like a brand friend. new slate for you. Like, yeah. That's a well, a little, it's now it's been over a year. But, yeah. Uh, yeah. Um, but yeah, I, I, my friend gave me a bike. It was like a really, really nice road racing bike Ooh. that she didn't need anymore. Cause she actually has an even nicer bike. <laughs> um, and I couldn't use it cause I was on these heavy duty blood thinners, but I was still swimming a lot. And so last August when I wasn't on blood thinners anymore and my heart was fully healed and I got clearance to, um, be able to do all my normal activities again. Um, I started riding my bike and like learning how to be a cyclist and swimming a lot. And, um, I was very fortunate in that there wasn't like a strong financial pressure for me to get a full-time job right away again. Um, but I was also just like, I won't go into the weeds, but like mentally I was not in a good place for a very long time when I had to like learn how to live on my own and like figure out who I was outside of um, work. And kind of like after this very emotionally traumatic time of like, like, almost dying and then thinking you're presenting amazing die. you're presenting amazing today. <laughs> ba ba no really based on all the shit that you've Thank been you. through right you've um, got a life reset with great perspective on every phase of your life yeah it, it just made me think like Puts okay well what really matters mm -hmm. like do i want to do i want to feel busy and feel productive and send emails out till 11 p.m and see these checks coming in the mail and like get these commission checks and stuff and just feel like I'm chasing, like I'm on the hedonic treadmill. Like when, when is it enough? Like what, what is on the other side? When you say it's enough. And I was, I, I realized I'm in a very fortunate position to mm -hmm. be able to choose not to get another full-time job yet. Um, but I, I also like, like mentally, I don't think I could, <laughs> Like, I just, it's just so difficult for me to go back to that. Um, so for a little over a year, I've been doing part-time consulting in antibody engineering. So I'm helping companies who are trying to make these antibody drugs. <coughs> I'm helping them kind of like as an outsourced scientist, but also from like a business perspective. I've been working with a lot of private equity companies and VCs um, who are investing in or looking to invest in companies that are um, making antibody therapeutics. I'll do their scientific due diligence for them. Um, I'll help with going through the pitch decks and looking at like, um, what's what, cause you know, these are finance people. They're not yep. scientists. So I help explain to them, like, is this business doing well or is it not like for these reasons? Um, what would I recommend their next steps be for growth, expansion, headcount, equipment, technology, all this stuff. So that's kind of the thing I've been doing is like, ad hoc like consulting i i do like shorter term you know multi-month contracts with um biotech companies or private equity vc companies um but you know it's all part-time i choose my own hours um sometimes i book more things and sometimes i'm like i just need a month <laughs> so you got full yeah. control of your life which is good Travel. there's and nothing like, wrong with things. that but yeah, since you shouldn't feel been, guilty about it either. I've been getting really into cycling. Um, Yay! I have this like something I do problem where I like when I get really excited about something, I go all in. Like I did on <laughs> swimming, I did a bunch of like marathon type swim things. Like last summer, I um, I swam from the Bay Bridge to Ocean Beach, which is a um, ten mile swim. So in kilometers, that is. Uh, 
I don't know. Is that like 18 kilometers? 16. I don't know. 16? Yeah, 16 kilometers. One point, well, 1. Yeah, 6, 10, roughly. 10K is about 6, 6.4 miles. So put that into pers- like if you use that as a context. Yeah, and right. I did some other like very long swims too. So I was getting really into that. And um, since I started uh, riding a bike about nine months ago, I've um, I've already ridden 5,000 miles this year, like in seven, less than seven months. Wow. Um, I, I rode for 10 days in Spain. Huh. on a big trip there i did all the famous climbs in spain like roca corba and all these ones that like the pros do um and actually just in the beginning of july i rode my bike um self-supported self-supported bike packing from seattle to san francisco and what's that distance um it's 1200 miles so in kilometers oh, uh, uh, yeah you're close to 20 20 20 000 kilometers um, and I did it in 12 days. Wow. That's uh, no, a lot of writing. No rest days. And it's obviously very mountainous. A lot of cl- hill, like m- climbing mountains and the coast. The um, heart's so- holding up? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Doing good. Um, I mean, I don't know. I can't yeah. see it. So I far, just- so good. You haven't had it's any more gonna- strokes, right? Yeah. I'm Nothing's like, happened. I, I just want to live my life and enjoy every day and the community around sports has been so fun to be around because unlike work or other areas of my life where it's very competitive, sports are actually the opposite. It's very uplifting. People like genuinely care about you it's doing team well. oriented. It's beautiful. Yes. Like both in that day and in that sport that you're doing. And there's all like, not just accountability to do workouts, but people like you just get to know people really well. Cause you see the same people like every other day or every day in the different sports and they like become your support network and you go to them for things that are unrelated to the sport you're doing together. Like my swim pod, my swim friends, like we came together for swimming we got to know each other for swimming. But now it's like on Saturday nights, like yeah. we have a swim pod party and we just shoot the shit and we hang out. And like my cycling friends, now I like go do fun stuff that are unrelated to cycling with my cycling friends. And it's just been you like, living life. It's beautiful. Yeah, yeah. I spend, I mean, on an average day, I spend about one hour looking at my computer, which is probably why you couldn't get a hold of me for a while. Cause sometimes I just don't check my email for like three weeks. <laughs> that, my, I'm, I'm actually That's really good. jealous. That's good. So basically, Sarah, just, just, just to recap, just to recap. So wasn't anything Jeff Collins said? No? No, we're good? It was Jesus, not. Jesus, you're really oh, hammering right. me today, hey, Curry. Yeah, we, yeah, maybe yeah, Collins well, gave her the advice that she's got to get more of a work-life balance. You know, yeah, maybe, maybe, maybe you, worry about your family yeah, yeah. friends and have some fun instead of worrying about yeah. work. Yeah. I'm like jealous, it. though, to not check your email for three weeks or two yeah. weeks. That's, well, that's that was grand. more like the, one day. The Seattle trip because I was, it was, such, I mean, I already am outside a lot every day. So I'm like, I go on a five hour bike ride every Tuesday. I like, I'm out riding for at least half the day, three times a week, and I'm swimming three, four times a week for an hour or two at a time. So I'm, and then there's all the time like around it, like getting set up and doing the stuff. So I'm outside for a large proportion of the day, every single day. Connect with nature um, too, yeah. Yeah, and that feels really good. But especially on the Seattle trip, um, I it was like so actually strange coming back to society afterwards because I was used to waking up at dawn, packing up my camping stuff, being out, out like on the bike for ten hours, mm-hmm. um, sometimes longer with like food stops and stuff. And then I was doing it with one friend. So it was just me and her together. Um, And then we would just like try to either hotel, take a shower, go to bed, or we'd camp. But like, we're just outside for all of daylight doing something that's really freaking hard. It was by far the most physically demanding thing I've ever done in my life. We were riding a hundred miles a day for 12 days. Yep. Yep. Um, And (laughs) that's when I didn't check my email for three weeks. Cause for two weeks I was doing that and there's like stuff on either end and stuff. Um, <laughs> but yeah, it was just kind of like an amazing reset that like the world will keep moving. People will keep having their problems. People will keep needing to feel busy. Um, but like there's, uh, there's other things out there. Like 
you can, <laughs> it was just so amazing, like watching the sunrise and sunset every day and being on the bike for the entire day and just watching the world kind of like have this pulse and like this breathe, like breathing that the world just like keeps going and all the stuff you do on your computer, like doesn't really matter. <laughs> Like the world's going to keep spinning It'll be the sunrise is going to keep rising regardless of all that. And so it's don't just fret. Of, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, See, all you got to do is add running well, now and you can do a triathlon. You're so close. <laughs> Everyone asks me, it's like, I do yeah. these like ultra swimming, distance biking, bike things, bro. ultra distance swimming things. And I look up a triathlon. It's like you swim for an hour or like you swim like 4,000 meters. I'm like, that's it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, that's but, fire. Like, that's fire. <laughs> no, it's kind of sad because I look up the run. I'm like, oh, I have to run a 5K. I can't do that. <laughs> yeah, that's hilarious. <laughs> no, I haven't done triathlon. But yeah, um, that's probably why you couldn't get a hold of me. I was like, probably out on my bike or something. But um, yeah, that's, that's a not yeah. so good story, but a great story. You yeah. Know yeah. Mean? So well, thank you. So I, I, do you? Can we go? Let, let's. Um, just you Curious and Alcatraz. as to yep. just just for context now that we're if we can go back to um your profession like, like what what got you what got you basically um to w why we reached out to you during the pandemic right to give us that yeah. context um I'm curious as to your thoughts now, one year removed from, yeah, because pretty much we could safely say as of around April, 2022, things started to open up. Uh, we're now more than a year removed. Um, we're starting to do that post-mortem, right? That, that post-research of how it all transpired. And I, I've got a lot of questions um, on your on like wh what you think and how it all transpired. Um, if you're, if, are you open to to having those chats and just kind of like talking about that? And oh yeah, especially if like rookie, if we COVID. can go back to yeah, well, just first of all, I do you guess, have any legal yeah. battles that you got to keep your mouth shut about or anything like that? You uh, know no, I mean? no, no, we're all good. Okay, so. Um, yeah, like I mean, for example, if I can give you, let, let's start the let, from a context perspective. Um, we're doing a lot of, um, you know, people are doing a lot of post mortem, um, and how we treated the lockdown measures. And I guess hindsight's always twenty twenty, um, but you know, for example, there, there's a lot of of the of the phase three trials that Pfizer did and you know, 41,000 subjects uh, on that, you know, that's now coming out. It's coming out in the house of commons committees. Like let, let, what are you, what are your thoughts on that one, one year as a scientist, as someone who has been on this flu, the universal flu vaccine journey and thoroughly believes in MRNA and, and that, and that sort of thing. Just curious as your, um, your thoughts on it all. Well, I guess I should preface this by like, I haven't really been paying all that much attention to the official postmortem that's been happening in the past few months in the US. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> because yeah, fair enough. when I'm like on my computer, I'm just focusing on my work, which mm -hmm. is like engineering antibody drugs. <laughs> yep. um, and I also, I think I needed kind of a break from it because the the pandemic, it was a very intense time for me because I was working harder than I ever had. It was very, it was just a lot. Um, I was working at home in a one bedroom apartment, like with my partner um, and my company was thrown into the national spotlight because of the work we were doing on the therapeutic antibody for COVID and because the Netflix show just came out. So I kind of needed to like not follow the news for a little while and just kind of just accept that like the world is going to keep spinning. People are going to keep arguing about COVID and I don't need to be a part of it. Just unplug. Um, it. Yes. But I think that it is a little unfortunate. It's actually a tragedy that 
science got mixed with policy to the extent that um, people were deciding policy without a, a good basis in the science. And they were using, I think people on both sides were trying to take scientific facts and twist them into political opinions. Um, but <laughs> like you said, hindsight is always twenty twenty, and it's easy to point fingers to be like, well, they shouldn't have said this or they're wrong about that. Or that was so stupid. But like everyone is, well, at least I, maybe I'm just like too much of an optimist, but I just assume that everyone is trying to do their best with the very limited information they have at the time. And that person is going to make decisions um, according to all of their biases, both unknown or both like that they know about and that they don't know about. Like those are things like their political background, their socioeconomic status, the amount of power they have in whatever spheres they work in. Um, so yeah, it's like, I've kind of just taken a step back from it all and um, accepted that people are always going to find something to argue about. <laughs> yeah. So, so I guess no. one thing let, let's, let's use, I'll give you, uh, give you maybe to put our, I want to put context to people who are watching and stuff like that. Cause you know, one things that I've, I've been kind of doing some reading online and, and, and watching, you know, this postmortem that's going on. I mean, obviously you can, I agree with you. You can sit there and criticize people for making decisions based on the limited information that they had or that they were given right at the time. Um, but I guess from the, I guess, okay. So for example, I'll give you an example. So in 1950, the U S population was around 157 million people. Polio is, you know, if rookie, if we can go back to the panel, that'd be great. That way I can just kind of have everyone else chime in. That'd be awesome. Um, and the, the, you know, polio was the vaccine was being rolled out at the time. And that test trial was about 1.8 million people at that time. Could you put some context fast forward to the, the phase three trial of Pfizer? This is right on the Pfizer biotech website. Um, that, that phase three trial, according to Pfizer was 41,000 people. Is that enough? Like, is that enough, uh, in your opinion, from a science, can you explain that to enough people? of a sample size, like, like the sample size of people based on the technology we know today, um, is 41,000, a big sample size, or is it, or was that because of a political, uh, situation at the time was operation warp speed, if we recall, um, so that uh, that's been trending on, on, and I hate to say online because I don't. That's not where I get my news. But do, you know what? I hope in you the media, what I'm talking about, right? Yeah. I mean, it's hard to say because with I mean, with polio, it's not contagious in the way that uh, COVID was. Okay. Um, so there's more time to enroll people in a trial and figure out who can be excluded or included. I think for the COVID vaccines, there was some time pressure because Huge. it was, yeah, I mean, so many people were dying yeah. that they, to find enough people that meet the inclusion criteria is actually really difficult. Um, because I, I don't know the, what the basics of the trial design were exactly, but most people who would sign, like want to sign up for the trial will be ineligible for kind of like random reasons. Like they're too old, they're too young. They have this other, they take this medicine, they take like whatever, probably they tried to find a lot more people, but the trial has to have like this, like perfect, pristine, unbiased population and finding those people really, really quickly to get emergency use approval for a drug is very challenging. So without knowing the details, my guess is that that's the most people they could find with the time 
timeline that they were given to find people. Now, could you fair. talk about, and could, yeah, and that's fair. That's perfect. Um, could you comment on then more? No, I, no, I can't say more so in the U.S. It's definitely in Canada. With now all the, you know, in the U.S., definitely. Um, but and in, in Canada. In can <laughs> somewhat in Canada. Um, the lobby, the, the lobbyists and the registers of the lobbyists of these massive pharmaceutical companies. Mm -hmm. You know, I've heard numbers of two to one to the, the Congress people on, on the Hill. Um, does, does that concern you or is that more of, is that just a natural, a usual thing that takes place in your, in your realm of study, in your industry, in your industry, the, the lobbying that went on, um, is that, should that be a concern to anybody or, or do you see that as a natural progression or do you see that more of a, um, business kind of the capitalistic, um, side of the business yeah i just i mean the lobbying is going to happen um the pharmaceutical industry is part of capitalism it has a lot of flaws <laughs> um but at the end of the day the covid vaccines reduce the risk of death and they reduce the chance of adverse outcomes of having covid <clears throat> like they basically they are in a work for the tool. most part right yeah, they're an important tool that helped us get through the pandemic and they reduced the risk of death. So full stop, the vaccines work. They're important. On a personal level, whether people want the vaccine or not, or whether they agree with the way the pharmaceutical industry has always operated with lobbying and politics, is kind of like, a. I mean, you got, I guess if you if you want the medicines that save people, unfortunately with like capitalism, you also have to take the downsides of that as well. So um, I think it's like an extremely flawed industry with like how you could have like political affiliations and money guide like which drugs get prioritized and which Elf. don't. Right. And like, which yeah. people get elected into office and which don't. But at the end of the day, we needed those medicines and now we have them. So I see it still as like a net positive that we're able to get those vaccines out so quickly and all those lives were saved um, because we have effective vaccines. Regardless of the bullshit and rhetoric. That... Yeah. yeah. And people are always going to want to go back and point fingers and then expose the flaws. And I think that actually is good for like, you know, for the journalists to expose those things because it keeps the industry more accountable. And um, yep. even though I'm not like personally involved in exposing the pitfalls of pharmaceutical industry in capitalism, um, <laughs> I'm glad that somebody's doing it. Because if left unchecked, they, there's just too much power and money wrapped up Slippery in that, slope. that it could go very wrong. So I'm glad that somebody's doing the postmortem and looking into it. Um, and I'm glad it's not me. And I'm glad <laughs> that we have, I'm glad that we have effective vaccines. But vaccines, like any medicine, there are risks of side effects. Sure. Um, there is no such thing as a drug that doesn't have a chance of um, a side effect, whether that be severe or not. Um, so it's always, I think it's a personal decision. Like, does the potential benefit of taking this medicine outweigh the risk of the side effects, um, that accompany it? And for COVID, I think for most people, the risk of the vaccine was low enough and the benefit was high enough that it was, um, it made sense to take the vaccine. And I think that's what helped us get through the pandemic to a point where we are now, where we have vaccines and medicines to treat COVID. And um, while COVID is still around, I guess, it's just not, we're on the other side of it now. What, I've um, got a, go ahead, go ahead, Bondo. No, I, I, I guess I was just, I was going to branch off a little bit and just, talk about maybe your prospects of, 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 of returning to Centivac in the, in the future. Um, I don't know exactly. Um, 
I still have a good relationship with Jake Glanville, who's the CEO. Um, but I mean, I handed off my stuff to the other people during that one year, um, yep. like period I had with them. Or... Um, and I do kind of feel like that chapter of my life has closed. Okay. Like I don't need to go back and do more of what I was doing in that capacity. I think it would also just be, yeah, I, I'm kind of working on some, my next thing kind of like, you know, under the hood, working on figuring out and starting what my next thing will be. And I don't know if I need to go back to doing what I was doing. Um, I think I just have to, I would like need to consider my reasons. Is it to just to go back to the grind of what I had been doing before? Yeah. Um, Or is it, or is it a passion, right? Yeah. I mean, I, I set up, I helped set up Centivax for success and they're doing really well now. I believe they got their, they got some seed round of funding or they're working on their series a or something. Um, or they got, um, they got an initial round of funding. That's what they, they have secured. Okay, good. Yeah. So they got their first round of funding. Um, they, they're working on some other drugs too, but their lead, um, therapeutic asset flu vaccine, which was (laughs) the project that I built, um, built up from the ground. So I feel very proud that I was part of that and that I know that they wouldn't be where they are today had I not built that. Um, yeah, well, that's good. I also feel like I've done my work there and there's What's next? there are other opportunities for me in the future. Um, so I don't, my my identity as a human no longer needs to be my identity with Centivax. Gotcha. So what's a, what's a sniff of your future? Do you have it yet for us? Oh, I don't really. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. We'll see. <laughs> <laughs> so you will come into Niagara to do to do the the, the road cycling up here. Obviously, yeah. is on cycling the, marathon, on maybe but huh? Niagara cycling marathon, one hundred and twenty k. That's like nothing for you. That's like you know a warm up. That's like a warm up. <laughs> Yeah, right? it sounds fun. I'll right. Come, what, what day is it? I'll fly out there and do it. <laughs> well, it'll be next year. It'll be next year. She's uh, on the way. Yeah. Uh, don't worry. We'll let you know. Okay. There's also the ride to conquer cancer. That's a big one. There's also the one that goes from Montreal to Toronto. That's another good one. Right. You can you, you know, go from travel. vineyard to vineyard. I mean, I love it, Sarah. I mean, I hate the fact that you had a stroke. And I think that's probably at your young age what kind of. <laughs> shook you a little bit right but you know based on our previous discussions you're you 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 presented like the four of us meatheads and you know we're all workhorses as well to a certain extent and we're all trying to i I think it's a breath of fresh air because you're you're stepping back from your your professional life and you're absolutely you're focusing on your personal life and at the end of the day that's what it's all about and that's what we work. We are we are constantly working to try and balance that because we probably work and have worked too much. Yeah, right? I so, know the feeling. I had yeah. so many. Most of my days involve starting work around nine and leaving work around eight or nine p.m. Yeah, and driving home. And at least one weekend day, I was working. And if I yeah. wasn't at work, I was like on the couch, on my computer. <clears throat> writing contracts, sending emails, um, you know, writing technical documents. In a weird way, though, you're lucky to have suffered that stroke because I think it prematurely aligned your priorities. Change your perspective. It kind of woke me up to what matters. So now, like, I have, I've been able to engineer my life so that I'm surrounded by people where when I hang out with my friends, it's not for, to advance my career. It's not for networking. I don't get anything out of them. I just like being around them and they like being around me. And that feels really good to like vibe with people in such a way that we just genuinely like each other's company. Mm -hmm. And that's so different from 
like I think my experience with work where you're always trying to like get ahead and prove yourself and like use people because they're useful to you. Um, and well, for, for social <laughs> gatherings are not the same as, you know, personal fun laughter gatherings, right? Like, yeah. Laughter is the best medicine without a doubt. Oh, 100%. yeah. Yes. So it's just very refreshing to be around people that um, just genuinely want to be around me because of who I am. And then mm -hmm. like, you know, likewise for them. Um, and it just gives me a lot more satisfaction with life and feeling like every day is really just like <clears throat> a gift. Like it's an opportunity to enjoy the day. Um, rather than an opportunity or just like a reason to be stressed out and try to get a million things done and then feel accomplished because I checked off my to-do list. And there are, I have days like that sometimes because I have to like be a real person and pay the bills and stuff. Um, but I've balance. definitely I've had to, yeah, I've definitely had a recalibration over the past year or two with figuring out like what really matters. How do I want to spend my days? Um, what, like what happens on the other side? Like when is enough enough? Like how, mm. how long are you going to be on the treadmill for? <laughs> yeah. How, how's the rest of your family doing? Like how, how did they, like, I know your, well, at least, um, perception is like, you're, 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 you're pretty close to your sister, right? Yeah. And, yeah. And, you know, and, um, you, you know, your mom and your dad and like, how, how did that impact them? Um, well, obviously, they were very scared for me um, during the time when, like, I didn't really know what was happening. And I didn't know how to fix the PFO um, in my heart. Um, but they've been really supportive. I think they wished I lived closer because they're in Madison, Wisconsin. Um, but I do try to, like, go back relatively frequently. And also my sister has a son, my nephew, um, he's, he'll be two in August. So I, I go back and like nice. hang out with them. I'm actually going back for his second birthday That's awesome. um, in about a month. <clears throat> um, but yeah, they've been really supportive. I think that they're just happy that I'm doing well and that I am like happy in my current lifestyle. And they, I mean, they saw how stressed out I was with work and um, burnout is a bad thing. In business. Totally burned out. And you got one long life. Just be happy. Yeah. yeah. Right. Like you got one, you got to chase one thing. Happiness, yeah. And that's it. It's right? also like eye opening to think that like, had I not been an athlete for a year before my stroke, I may not have come out of it the way I did. So just knowing it's almost like, like fate that you started to exercise just before that happened. So yeah. you can be where you're at right now. Yeah. And I think my family is quite aware of that too. And they've been very um, supportive of my crazy athletic um, endeavors because they know <laughs> that it's making me a healthier person who is less likely to have any issues. Um, I would say I've really gone to the extreme end of, um, sports so maybe but it makes you mentally it. healthy too sports right not just physically it makes you mentally yeah. healthy yeah it's taught me a lot about like what i said about swimming relinquishing control um managing panic but also just pushing through extreme pain not just for a little bit but for a long time and mm. learning that the body can handle so much more than you think and it's really the mind that breaks first and yep. when the mind gives up, everything falls apart. So learning, and but also like when the mind is giving up, learning how to pass the baton to the body so that the body can take over when the mind can't go anymore. And then when the body starts to give up again, you can pass the baton back to the mind, like kind of learning this like push and pull, this balance of um, struggle. And I do it on my treadmill, Sarah, right? Because <laughs> I, I call it beast mode, right? Where I just yeah. get into a point where it's just my body, right? Like my yeah. head's telling me, like, look at your gas, right? Yeah. And it's like, you know what? You're in your championship round, so you're just getting your beast yeah. mode and let her let her go, right? So and then just you and get it, your Yeah, you totally. It's given me a lot of perspective about things that don't matter, which is most things. Yeah. <laughs> but like 
things that I get all riled up about and I can kind of talk myself down and um, I just don't get bothered by most things the way that I used to. Um, And And that's refreshing. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. I don't get as bothered by people or things not going the way I wanted or um, not being able to control situations. I'm 47 and that's still a work in progress for me. (laughs) Right. So, and I mean, I'm working at it very hard. So good on you. Right. Like it's, it's tough. (laughs) It's tough. It's tough. Especially if you've, you've been on a fast moving train for a while. Right. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. But yeah, I I do miss my family and I, yeah, I am really looking forward to going back in a few weeks and seeing my sister and um, my nephew, Oliver. Do it up. Well, I think watch that nephew because he'll be 10 before you know it. I know. Goes quick. Goes quick. Right. And then go to a cheap, go, go to a game, go to a game now, go, go to a Packers game. You have time. I haven't been to a Packer game since like I was in high school. That's on my back. <laughs> right. You got you to wear that big piece of cheese. Yeah, yeah you got to be a cheese head. You got to be a cheese head. <laughs> oh, definitely. Yeah, I do. I've been to Lambeau Field a few times. It's a really cool place. <laughs> that that is on my bucket list. I I just to see Lambeau Field. And this it's fall, too bad Aaron Rodgers isn't there anymore. But I still want to. No, go. there you go. Yeah. 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 <laughs> He's that so Rogers. cute. I had a crush on him. Or still. Oh, Aaron Rodgers. Yeah. It's that it's that salt and pepper graze he's got, so, right? You like that older? So Sarah, brother? you, you kind of look past the anti-vax uh, uh, thing of Aaron Rodgers. That's still cool. Being a former chief, being a former Packer. You know, I don't have to agree with everything that a person does um, in order to think that they're cute. Yeah, yeah. (laughs) Yeah, You're not marrying them, are you, sir? I'm not marrying them. (laughs) But also, like, Um, people people are just people. Like, at the end of the day, they're going to make decisions based on their own life experiences, which are different from yours. Um, And, like, we we all just want to feel happy. We want to feel good around our friends and family. Um, we want to fit in and I give people a lot more slack now, um, because not everyone has access to the same information that I have. Not everyone Mm. has privilege to have the same educational background that I have. And even the people that do may come to different conclusions given the same set of information. Like that's the beauty of, um, individuality. yeah, an individual and intellectual is you get to look at facts and um, and have those biases of your own life and be a different person than the person next to you. Like, See, and, I struggled and I a that, little bit with that though, Sarah, it, because I, I I didn't I never viewed my 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 academia as as like a lottery or something, right? Because that's a grind, right? Like, and 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 you're fortunate, I guess, that you've got a. a you know, I guess what I'm realizing is a higher functioning brain, right? <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> but no, just to, to to enable you to to navigate the academia, right? And I guess some people don't have that brain, but you still have to work your ass off, man. Like, oh, you yeah. know what I mean? Yeah, to, there was a lot of grind involved. In right. And, and, and you that. and you know that there's a good portion of the population that even with your skill set and your tools are going to go. I don't, I'm not taking that ride. Right. So that's where I get tripped up on the, on trying yeah. to give people slack. Right. I, what, I'm a little harder. Happens, like when people are extremely opinionated, um, but don't have the work ethic to back up how they got to be so opinionated, I just yeah. write them off and don't yeah. take them seriously at all. <laughs> exactly. It's like, all right, you're bye. You I'm, got it. You got it figured out. Right? Yeah. I, I just don't need to pay attention to you. <laughs> True. But that's why, like, like being smart doesn't really matter. It's do you no. have the drive to put in the work to what you love do to do what you love every day and become good at it? You don't yeah. actually need to be smart or talented, but you need to show up. You need to work hard. 100%. You need to get up early. Um, yeah. You need to do it day after day after day, even when you don't want to do it anymore. And yeah. then you'll eventually either be successful or like figure out what you wanted to figure out or be able to build something. And those, those people I respect a lot more that like tried really hard. Um, even when like, doesn't really matter if they're like naturally gifted at whatever. 
hundred percent. Hundred percent. I have a lot more respect for people. Put in that, the effort, right? Yeah. And that's why yeah. you like the athletics now, because that's what it takes for athletics. To, <laughs> Even yeah. cornhole, eh, hey, Jeff? Even, Even cornhole. cornhole. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you, you you know a- athletes are just this. They're, they're, I have so much admiration and respect. You know, I, I I actually train three times a week with some professional hockey players and they're, they're not NHLers. They're right below. Um, and to see the effort that they put in a day in and day out, you know, six days a week, I'm a three day, three day a week kind of a person. And, um, and the rejection that they get, you know what I mean? They go, they, they get called up, they, they get sent back down, they get called up, they get sent back down. And the men, you know, you, you touched on it, the mental fortitude that they have to have to keep persevering and to go after that dream of theirs is just completely admirable. Um, and, you know, I think not only you mentioned and you touched on something which was from a health perspective, you know, if you hadn't started a year earlier, you might not have come through it, but also you, you can't, um, discount the mental toughness that being an athlete gives you right like the getting into the water when it's freezing cold and overcoming all those obstacles also got you through and will still get you through the postpartum of of this you know massive life-changing event and it's amazing the dna that gets what, what the body can do and what you get taught from other athletes similar to you. Do you know what I mean? Like it's just, and yet you're an amateur at the same time. Like you're not a professional, like that's not your full-time gig, but like my mindset has completely changed to like listening to these guys who, and, and then like they're in their mid twenties. Like, I mean, where I look at a set of exercises and weights and my brain says yes. And my body says, what the hell are you doing? Curry. Like not a chance, right? <laughs> and it's like, but it's okay. Failing's okay. And they're doing hundred pound dead bill, you know, dumbbell uh, uh, squats. And I can only do 50 or 60. Like it just, it is what it Wait. is, but they are professionals, but it's just Wait. getting around that mindset. <laughs> and I think you've also touched on that as well. I mean, right. Uh, yeah. I think that probably taught you something. For sure. And a huge part of being an athlete is learning how to bounce back quickly from a setback. Like things often don't go to plan. And when you get that into your head and then you don't perform well for the rest of the day or the rest of the game or the rest of whatever it was, that's just going to crush you. But like learning how to come back, like say I'm swimming and I get a crazy zinger from a jellyfish and it's like, well, I could panic and I could freeze up and I would get hypothermia and die and not make it back to shore. Or do I say, okay, well, I, my arm hurts a lot, but I'm just going to take a deep breath and keep swimming back to shore. Like that's kind of an extreme example that actually has happened. (laughs) Yeah. Oh, really? eh? Yeah. I have like a bunch of scars on my arms from like uh, Pacific sea nettles and like these crazy jellyfish, but, um, that's just like, don't, an don't you have example. to get peed out of the jellyfish too? Like that's what's, <laughs> you know, when I first, I posted on Instagram, these crazy welts I had, and I have never had so many DMS of people offering to pee on me before. <laughs> <laughs> That it's a good, day, good way to find dates, eh? I got a jellyfish. Like, right? wow, there's like a whole corner of the internet that loves this shit. Yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. Jellyfish <laughs> fetish pee. <laughs> I'm pretty wow. concerned. Yeah. If you go down that, if you go down into that corner of there, Sarah, you'll never have to work a day in your life. Guaranteed. <laughs> guaranteed. I, I heard Aaron, Aaron Rodgers loves peeing on jellyfish. Oh, oh yeah. Too. Yeah, Aaron Rodgers, Aaron Rodgers is all over that. Aaron, uh, Aaron Rodgers loves that. I'm sure. <laughs> Him and Joe Rogan talked about it one night on Shrooms. You could 100. percent There you go. There's your end. <laughs> I liked yeah, you before. I, I liked you even more now that you've uh, made the changes that you have, Sarah. <laughs> oh, thank you. Yeah. Yeah, and you know what? You, you said in an email back to me. You're like, and and I now I have context to all of your comments and your emails and stuff. So I'm just being facetious. I'm just having some fun but you're just like what do i have to offer i'm not at scent of x and i had the stroke and this is i knew about this the guys didn't know about this because 
It's kind of he doesn't share his shit with us. No, no. <laughs> no I mean, it's for health information. I'm not broadcasting it. I didn't um, mean, like. I didn't try to keep it a secret, but I also just didn't like post it on my public. No, you didn't media. want to talk about it. Yeah, yeah. Um, it's Brandon likes to know shit. None of the rest of us knows all the time. Well, it's I'm a kinda, secret. Well, I'm it's also a kind of fiduciary, fetish. boys. Kind of, kind of, kind of a legal thing. Yeah. But anyway, um, excellent. <laughs> um, but you know, I let, let's put it this way. We. We 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 want you back on to the the normal rotation of our show. Yeah, um, we want you back. We love having you on. I want to see where you go. I want. Well, to I think what you said. Out. What you said you yourself, Sarah. You've come up to Canada we, before. You haven't yet. We like you as you. You know, not as your profession. You're just a good person. That's why you're yeah. great to have on the show. Oh, thank you. And, I appreciate and you, that. You keep us in line, so that's that's also another good thing. That <laughs> you make me want to go jump in some cold water right now. Honestly, that's what I, um, to I don't know about that. I'll one. go swim or sure. get my fat ass on the bike. <laughs> <laughs> but um, how about we have you back on again? Because I know you are in San Francisco. It's three hours. Uh, it's almost nine a.m. where you are after your first um, triathlon. <laughs> yeah, you'll probably do a triathlon. A triathlon I'm actually, today. as soon as we hang up, I'm about to go ride my bike. With my friend. Nice. Figured it. Yeah. I go. got two questions though. One, okay, have you ever Lindy, swam? Go. Yeah, have you ever swam to Alcatraz? I, I looked times. it up. It's about two point four kilometers, so it's not a not a. That's what oh, yeah, Trevor many, just did. He did it many times. The tricky okay. part about that is that you have to get like approval from vessel traffic service, which is basically like yeah. air traffic control, because it's a it's a major international shipping highway. Mm-hmm. Um, between Alcatraz and San Francisco. So all those like tankers and the cargo ships coming from China and Taiwan, they're coming through there. Um, And those things are huge. So the biggest challenge is just like time. Well, one time you arrive with the tides because it has to be what they call slack. So the the water is neither moving in nor out. It's like actually just shifting, kind of swirling. Um, So it has to be timed right for that and for the boats. So for that reason, and you need a support boat to like kind of go along with you to protect you against like fishing boat traffic and then also be on the radio with the pilots of the tankers. Um, so for that reason, it's not a very swim most times. Um, but that being said, I have swum it. I've swum two Alcatraz once and I swum, I jumped off a boat at Alcatraz and swam to shore, I don't know, probably five or 10 times. Um, but that's, I mean, that's like an hour it's less than an hour swim. It's like a 40 minute swim, 35 if the tides are right. But still um, cool to say that you swam both to and from Alcatraz. Yeah. You've escaped Alcatraz right. essentially. I have so, escaped from Alcatraz. <laughs> second question. It's a shameless plug for, from our last podcast, but Ryan Atwood or commissioner Gordon, Ben McKenzie, new book. You know who ben we're McKenzie referring to? Book on crypto. Yeah, cryptocurrency. He was on our EOC. podcast a couple of weeks ago. The so OC actually, or Gotham. Oh, cool. I have this weird thing with crypto where, like, <laughs> actually, I shouldn't laugh about it. Maybe I don't know. It doesn't really laugh about it. Now. Laugh but, um, about it. When I was having my stroke, like actively on the couch having a stroke, the conversation immediately preceding that, my boyfriend at the time we were having a conversation about crypto and he was, I asked him some question that I, cause he was explaining something and I asked him about some word about it. And then I had a stroke and I remember <laughs> thinking like, what the crypto f-? caused it. I was like, what the <laughs> f-? I was so, I just remember feeling so confused and I was like, am I just too stupid to understand crypto? And then I realized I was having a stroke. Like, Whoa. <laughs> Uh, you I should read about it. Well, <laughs> like, you should read his book. Ever and since that day, I'm like, I don't understand crypto and I don't even care anymore because I had a stroke. I thought about it so hard that it gave me a stroke. A stroke, yeah. Stay right. far away from it. That's all. <laughs> I'm sorry. But yeah, I maybe I <laughs> should read the Watch book the, now and I understand. It. Order the book. Order the book on Amazon or wherever. It's actually a New York Times bestseller, all because of our podcast, but actually does don't don't double check that fact. Um, <laughs> don't fact check that. Yeah, because don't fact check that. that. It's 100%, 100% because of our 45 minute, minute interview with Ben McKenzie. Um, <laughs> but watch, it's great. Uh, and uh, yeah, so we are going to we'll, have you on again. We'll definitely have you back on. I want, I, want a, I want an update. We want an update yes. in terms of 
what you're doing, even if that's a dog, you know what I mean? Your swims, your bike, your, your Aaron Rodgers relationship. <laughs> yeah, the Aaron Rodgers relationship. We really want to know. <laughs> so far, just eye candy. <laughs> <laughs> as long as you keep smiling. <laughs> All right. So well, we're gonna let you go. We're gonna let you go on a bike. So Bondo. Great seeing you again, Sarah. Great seeing you again. Out. Great to chat with you guys. Thanks, Bondo? a million. Help us help you stay informed. Bye, everybody.